This lecture is on the uh, implications of the Psalter as a book for understanding how the apostles use the Psalms. So we saw in the first lecture yesterday that what we have called the traditional approach, we tried to lay that out yesterday, to the question of which Psalms are Messianic has some positive aspects to it, but maybe doesn't match up with how the apostles use the Psalms to refer to Christ. So we laid out the traditional approach and then we did sort of look at some examples of what the apostles are doing. The apostles use the Psalms, the way they use the Psalms seems broader and freer than the traditional approach, although we, we did see some very positive things uh, in the traditional approach. But can we better understand what the apostles are doing by looking at the role of the Davidic Psalms within the book of Psalms, within the Psalter? An examination of the role of the Davidic Psalms in the Psalter will lay a foundation and open up other issues that will be important, uh, I think, for understanding maybe how the apostles are using the Psalms. So just a brief comment here about the Psalter as a book, and then we'll get to the evidence uh, in each of the books. To examine the role of the Davidic Psalms in the Psalter assumes there is evidence of editorial arrangement of the Psalms in the Psalter that has a purpose and goal. Editorial arrangement, the Psalms are arranged uh, and they're arranged for a purpose and a goal. Augustine himself wrote these words, quote, although the arrangement of the Psalms, which seems to me to contain the secret of a mighty mystery, hath not yet been revealed to me, unquote. Rabbi Eliezer, who said the Psalms are not presently in their right order, don't know how he knew that, but he said the Psalms are not presently in their right order, commented that if a person could determine that order, that person, quote, could raise the dead and do miracles. We're not going to raise the dead and do miracles, um, but we are going to talk about the arrangement of the Psalms. We don't have time to delve into this question in great detail, so we're building on what others have done. Um, so there are two books I'm going to mention here. I think they're in the bibliography that I would start with if you're interested in this topic. Uh, one is a foundational work of Gerald Wilson, the editing of the Hebrew Psalter back in 1985. His book sort of uh, rejuvenated this whole discussion, not that there weren't some discussions of it uh, before him, but uh, it uh, is really foundational for what's happened since. I don't agree with everything in the book, but it's foundational to the discussion of the uh, arrangement of the Psalms, and many of its principles are still used today. A more recent book that I've found very helpful is Michael Sneerly, The Return of the King, Messianic Expectation in Book 5 of the Psalter. He has an extensive discussion of what he calls editorial criticism, um, which lays out basic principles to discuss the organization of the Psalms. And the storyline of the book of Psalms, he lays out the storyline of the book of Psalms as a basis for his discussion of book five. So he so nearly just looks at book five. Of course, not everyone agrees on the extent of editorial arrangement. So there are disagreements on this. There are some who deny any editorial arrangements. Well, at least it's hard you almost have to say, okay, there's five books in the Psalter, right? Each book ends with a doxology. So there's book one, book two, book three, book four, book five, and each, each ends with a doxology, and maybe the whole Psalter ends with a concluding doxological Psalm 150. So at least uh, give, give us that, right? But, but beyond that, there are some who don't really think that uh, there's editorial arrangement <clears throat> um, and would deny maybe an overarching narrative uh, related to the Psalms, but it seems to me there is evidence, we'll lay out some of this, of editorial arrangement, uh, and there does seem to be an overarching narrative. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end with one dominant character throughout most of the Psalter, the royal Davidic figure who, who acts, and, and I, th I think the evidence will show that the Psalter is not strictly chronological in terms of David's life early on, but that it follows a general chronology moving from books one through five. So I'm going to comment briefly on each book of the Psalter, focusing on three basic questions. What types of psalms are in each book? 
including genre and author. What role do the Davidic Psalms play in the book? And how does this information support a general storyline in the book of Psalms? So I'll, I'll set forth some information um, in each book, and then <clears throat> I'll try to put that together in some kind of general narrative. So now we get to a point uh, where some of this evidence is in your uh, handout, uh, minimal, but uh, some of it is there. So evidence from books one through five. Okay, book one. Book one consists of Psalms 1 through 41. And so there are 41 Psalms in book one. 37 of them are Psalms of David. 37 out of 41. Four Psalms do not have a title. One and two, 10 and 33. Now, Psalms 1 and 2, I would argue, are introductory psalms for the whole Psalter, and it makes sense they don't have a title. Not having a title and then having almost every psalm in book 1 to have a title sets them apart from the rest of the psalms in, in book 1. Uh, and so Psalm 1 and 2 don't have a title. Neither do Psalms 10 and 33. Some think Psalm 10 goes with 9 and 33 goes with 32, whether or not you go down that road, uh, it's clear that most of the psalms in book one are Davidic psalms. 41 psalms, 37 are clearly uh, designated as Davidic psalms. Also, the highest number of types of psalms in book one are lament psalms. Hopefully you know what a lament psalm sets forth the struggles of the psalmist. There are 16 individual laments, one community lament, so there's 40% of the psalms in book one are individual lament psalms. Okay, let me talk about the narrative of book one, but I want to start here with just talking about Psalm 1 and 2 for just a few minutes. Introductory psalms that set the agenda for the book. Now, there are linguistic connections that we could talk about related to Psalms 1 and 2. Ashray at the beginning, Ashray at the, at the, at the end of beginning of Psalm 1, the end of Psalm 2, uh, Haggah is used, meditate plot. Okay, there's, 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 there are linguistic connections. We're, I'm going to focus on some of the content uh, here. So Psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm extolling the life shaped by Torah. Psalm 2 is a royal psalm, deals with kingship, extolling the triumph of the king. Okay, Psalm 1 profiles the cause and consequence of the righteous individual over against the wicked, uh, Clearly, if you under, know Psalm 1, that's there. Psalm 2 profiles the cause and consequence of the rebels against God and his king. So Psalm 1 focuses on the individual, individual Israelite who meditates on God's law. The Psalms are thus meant for our individual use of meditation. In fact, I think it, it's appropriate to look at the book of Psalms. Um, sometimes people look at things as mutually exclusive, but uh, the Psalter is a hymnal. There's uh, things related to that in some of the titles. It is a prayer book, and it is also to be used for meditation. It's to be used devotionally. All three of those, I think, are appropriate uh, to look at the Psalter that way. S some draw distinctions between those, and, but all three, I think, are significant. Psalm 2 focuses on God's king, who he has established to rule the ends of the earth, and all who take refuge in him are blessed. So the Psalter is about the reign of the king. Okay, then you bring into play this picture in Deuteronomy 17, uh, verses 18 through 20, about the king. Deuteronomy 17 talks about when you, when you ask for a king, a king who is to keep a copy of the law and read it all of his life. I mean, the king is supposed to be reading the law and meditating on the law, which is exactly what Psalm 1 says about Haish, blessed is the man, which can be used in a generic sense for any individualite any individual Israelite, but also in light of Deuteronomy 17, you can see how it also kind of relates to a king and, and in that sense can bind Psalm 1 and 2 together uh, around an emphasis on the king. Psalm 1 anticipates eschatological judgment and vindication. The righteous will stand. Psalm 2 sets a trajectory for the king who has enemies to face to establish his kingdom. So once you understand uh, how Psalm 2 is a royal psalm and that, and that this king has enemies, we're not surprised. Psalm 3, how many? 
How many are my foes? The first thing out of the, out of the gate in Psalm 3, how many are my foes? Uh, it's no surprise, many are rising against God's anointed. And in Psalm 3, even the son of the king joins in the rebellion of the historical title uh, talks about uh, when David had to flee from Absalom, his son. So the rest of book one overwhelmingly focuses on David with an emphasis on the difficulties he was experiencing in his life as the king. That's why there are so many lament psalms in book one, except for Psalm three and possibly Psalm seven. The psalms with historical titles mainly come from David's period of exile from Saul. So the, the psalms in book one that have historical titles telling you the situation of which they arose, 3, 7, 18, and 34. Uh, three is Absalom. Seven, we're not exactly sure. There's some differences of opinion about seven, but 18 and 34 would be from that period of exile in David's life when he was away from Jerusalem and ex, you know, running from Saul, 1 Samuel 16 through 31. Now, without an historical title, we cannot always figure out the event in David's life from which a psalm arises. Uh, it's the poetry of the Psalter uh, that relates to this. The poetry describes situations that David faced in very general ways, so it's hard many times to nail down specifically the setting that a psalm uh, arose from. Also, most of the, uh, also the historical titles in book one don't follow a precise historical order related to David's life. So it's not as if it's presenting something in, in precise historical order, but we're going to see there is kind of a general movement and narrative uh, as we move through uh, the books of the Psalter. Uh, where am I here? Okay, most of the experiences of David's life in book one revolves around conflict with enemies. <clears throat> no fewer than <clears throat> 30 of 41 Psalms make specific reference to the enemies of, of the psalmist, the enemies of David. That's, that's a, a real emphasis. David struggles to establish his kingdom, especially during the days he is on run from, from Saul. It seems to be reflected in book one. Book one is also bracketed by betrayal. In Psalm 3, it's from his own son. And in Psalm 41, 9, it's from a close friend. Yet Psalms 3 and 41 reflect the assurance of the Lord's protection from his enemies. In Psalm 3, the Lord is a shield around David so that he does not fear his enemies. And Psalm 41 affirms that David's enemies will not triumph over him, which is in line with the promises of the Davidic king given in Psalm 2. And the movement of the lament psalms also in book one would express confidence and praise. As you, as you probably know, the lament psalms, although they talk about the struggles of the, Davidic, of, of, the, of the psalmist, whoever the psalmist is, talks about the struggles of the psalmist, lays out the bad situation. But all lament psalms, except probably two, have a movement toward confidence and praise. 88 and 89, basically, are the two that... Uh, that don't. So that's a part of the hope that is expressed even in the midst of the Davidic troubles. So book one heavily, heavily focused on David and the struggles that David is experiencing. <clears throat> book two, Psalms 42 through 72. Now one of the principles, I'll start here, one of the principles from Wilson, who was, uh, I mentioned his book at the beginning, that has been widely accepted by those who argue for editorial arrangement of the Psalter is that there is a change of authorship when there is a change of book, uh, especially for books one through three. I mean, that happens when you move from book one to book two, from book two to book three, also from book three to book four. There's a change of authorship, not book five, and we'll mention that uh, when we get there. So we have gone from Davidic Psalms in book one, um, and we're going to see that there are Psalms of David in book two. But there's an author change because book two begins with Psalms of the Sons of Korah, Psalms 42 through 49. The Sons of Korah, maybe you remember, are descendants of the Levite Korah who led a rebellion against Moses in the wilderness in Numbers 16. <clears throat> First Chronicles 6.22 lists Korah as a descendant of Kohath, one of the three Levitical clans responsible for the sanctuary. This group was organized by David uh, for music in the sanctuary, 1 Chronicles 6.33. So again, there's strong 
Davidic connections, even though these are psalms by the sons of Korah. Psalm 50 is a psalm of Asaph, one psalm there uh, of Asaph, and he is also associated with David's organization of the temple worship, 1 Chronicles 16.37 and following. Of course, then there are psalms of David. Psalm 51 through 71 are psalms of David in book 2, and 70, Psalm 72 is the last psalm of book 2. It has the title of Solomon. Now, we'll come back here in just a second and talk about that particular psalm and that title. Types of psalms in book 2. There are 31 psalms in book 2. 21 of those psalms are psalms of David. So 21 out of 31 psalms in book 2 are psalms of David. Still a heavily Davidic emphasis. Um, so book 2 is closely associated with David by the psalms he has written and by the psalms composed by those associated with David the sons of Korah and Asaph. So sons of Korah and Asaph were there in David's time. They also have descendants uh, who were continuing uh, this kind of musical work in the temple. So you have to keep both of those things in mind. Okay, of the 21 Psalms of David, 13 of them are individual laments. So there's still a heavy emphasis on the problems that David is experiencing. So, book two, what can we say about the narrative, quote-unquote, narrative of book two? Book one winds down with a vulnerable David, still confident that God will establish him, Psalm 39, Psalm 41. The Psalms of the sons of Korah that opened book two, 42 through 49, set a tone of stability since David assigned them to worship at the settled tabernacle. Uh, possibly here despair is met with hope in the shared refrains of Psalm 42 and 43. You know, why are you cast down on my soul and why are you in turmoil within me? Well, hope in God, for I will again praise him, my salvation and my God. In the Psalms of Korah, the second half of this group of songs presents a royal psalm, Psalm 45, probably familiar with that psalm, visions of sub subdued nations and a restored Zion, Psalm 46 through 48, and then the last psalm of the sons of Korah, Psalm 49, and the only psalm of Asaph here in book two calls on the nations to hear words of wisdom from God. So as book two begins, it seems like there's a bit of stability um, related to David. But what's the first psalm? of the Davidic collection. Psalm 51, and you all know what that psalm's about, right? That's his confession because of his adultery with Bathsheba. So the Davidic Psalms in book two, 51 to 71, are framed by petition and lament psalms on both ends, 51 through 55, and then 68 to 61. But at the center of the Davidic Psalms, we do have Psalms of trust, 56 to 60, confidence, 61 to 64, and thanksgiving, 65 to 68. The concentration of historical titles, there's quite a few psalms in book two, uh, Davidic psalms with historical titles, 51, 52, 54, 56, 59, 60, and then 63. These work in tandem with the content of the psalms to picture a David who is deeply afflicted and praying. So this collection, 51 through 71, shows um, David who is deeply afflicted and praying. Psalm 51 is David's confession of sin with Bathsheba. The historical titles that follow Psalm 51 recount difficulties in David's life. Again, they're not in chronological order, but they're just recounting difficulties in David's life. They cover the changing circumstances of his life. Uh, and a lot of the difficulties that he faced um, related to the uh, Psalm 51, the first one, the sin of Bathsheba. Psalm 71 has no title. Many associate it with David, who speaks about his old age in verses 9 and 18. So no title, Psalm 71. It could be by David. There's certainly an emphasis uh, at, at the end here of this collection of Davidic Psalms on someone who is growing old. Verse uh, 9 and 18. 
And then considering the postscript at the end of Psalm 72, 70. So at the end of each book, there's a doxology. And at the end of, um, of book two, after the doxology, there is a postscript uh, that says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. OK, that's at the end of Psalm 72 after the doxology. In light of that, you could argue that the title of Psalm 72, which many Bibles translate of Solomon. And of course, what's the meaning of the Lamed preposition, right? Uh, it could be by Solomon. Most of the time, probably the Lamed preposition is used as authorship designation in the Psalter. But maybe here, the Lamed preposition can mean for, for Solomon. Maybe Psalm 72 is for Solomon, a prayer by David for his son Solomon. Um, the Davidic covenant from Psalm 2 would, would come into play here um, because Psalm 72 speaks about the righteous reign of a righteous king, and this could be David praying that Solomon's, his son Solomon would exhibit a righteous reign of a righteous king. So I have a pick up here from uh, my notes. The significance of Psalm 72, which occurs at the end of book two, is that it describes the righteous reign of a righteous king and the abundance of blessings that come to God's people when the king reigns in righteousness. Kings and nations serve him with his dominion being established from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth, which is a worldwide dominion broader than either the Davidic or the Solomonic kingdom. We talked about that yesterday, and a lot of people would see that appropriately, I think, as pushing us beyond the Davidic and the Solomonic uh, time period toward a king who will come and actually reign uh, with worldwide dominion. This is like Psalm 2, Psalm 72 is like Psalm 2, which promises the king that he will make the nations his heritage, which is Psalm 2, 8, which points, also points to a greater king whose reign will be broader than David or Solomon. So it's interesting in book 2, the very last psalm in book 2, Psalm 72, is either by Solomon or for Solomon. So we've kind of moved beyond David now. Uh, and uh, have a psalm here that relates to Solomon. Okay, book three, Psalms 73 through 89. There's also a change of authorship moving from book two to book three. At the beginning of book three, there's a collection of the psalms of Asaph. Okay, book two, we had one psalm of Asaph. Here we have a collection, 73 to 83, at the beginning of book three. Three, again, Asaph was from the time of David and his descendants were involved in the worship of the temple during Hezekiah's time and then after the exile during the time of Nehemiah. Then there are three psalms of the sons of Korah. So they come back into play in book three, 84 to 85, 87. And there is a psalm of Heman the Ezraite, Psalm 88, and then Ethan the Ezraite, Psalm 89, the identity of these two men are a bit more difficult, but there were two men with this name from the tribe of Levi mentioned along with Asaph as singers in the temple of Jerusalem. So you have these maybe same associations as we've had with the sons of Korah and with Asaph. Uh, these names, again, are very involved in the worship that David established. There's only one Psalm of David in book three, Psalm 86. All right, what about the different types of Psalms in book three? Well, instead of the predominance of individual laments in book three, there are more community laments in book three. There are 17 psalms in book three. There are five community laments, 74, 79, 80, 83, 85, over against four individual laments, 77, 86, 88, 89. The community laments emphasize the difficulties the community is having related to the temple and Jerusalem. So it's inter interesting now we have more community laments and they're lamenting that what's going on 
in Jerusalem and the temple, and it's the fact that enemies are coming in <laughs> and causing trouble. Um, that's what the focus is. So we'll come back here in just a second and talk about the significance of that. Let me, let me say just a quick word here that books one through three of the Psalter are bound together in such a way that you can conclude that they are, a, are the product of the process of literary composition. They, they, they kind of represent a stage in the development of the Psalter. There may have been earlier stages um, uh, of, of a Psalter, but um, books one through three are bound together in such a way that I think we could conclude that um, they represent a significant stage. And I say that um, because book two must go with book three um, because the psalms, there's, there's psalms that make up, and I don't know if you've heard of this, it's not, doesn't get a lot of emphasis. It's called the Elo, Elohistic Psalter. Um, psalms that use Elohim instead of Yahweh, predominantly use Elohim instead of Yahweh. And I haven't really done a whole lot of, of, of work uh, here, but, but, but the Elo, quote, Eloistic, Elo, Elohistic Psalter, uh, 42 to 83, is, is what is typically called the Elohistic Psalter. So 42 is the first psalm in book two. 83 is significantly into book three. So if that is supposedly a group, then that would bind together books two and three and maybe see that this is a significant stage for the development of the Psalter. Uh, there's not a consensus really on the, consent, on the um, significance of the Elohistic Histic Psalter, but um, but that's an interesting thing that that might um, set books one through three uh, as a stage, and then we're going to see there are there are significant differences between books one through three and books four and five, which we'll get to here in in just a bit. What about the narrative of book three? Well, the end of book two transitions from David to Solomon, so that in book three the focus is not on David. There's only one Davidic Psalm in book three but on his descendants and the breakdown that followed Solomon's kingdom as expressed in the individual lament of Asaph that begins book three. Uh, so the movement from Psalm 72 at the end of book two to Psalm 73 has been called, quote, a theological, emotional, and narrative whiplash. Uh, Psalm 72 expresses great hope in the kingdom of Solomon. But then Psalm 73 begins with this struggle that Asaph has um, <clears throat> related to the prosperity of the wicked. So the hope of Psalm 72 crashes into the desert of reality at the beginning of Psalm 73. The righteous flourish in Psalm 72, but at the beginning of Psalm 73, the wicked prosper. And of course, you know Psalm 73, that, that's at the beginning of the psalm, and then Asaph has a vision of uh, a renewed vision of God in the temple, and, and the second part of the psalm is totally different. It's really amazing to see this in the first part of Psalm 73. The wicked are stable. They're secure. And the righteous are on slippery ground. Asaph says, I almost slipped. My foot almost slipped. Um, and then he has this renewed vision of God in the temple. In the rest of the psalm, it's the righteous that are secure, and it's the wicked that are on slippery ground. So it's interesting to see that um, progression there in Psalm 73. And maybe this personal struggle is representative of what's coming in the rest of Book 3 of a larger national struggle rela uh, re related to the temple itself. Uh, so in Book 3, the surrounding nations are causing problems for God's people, 80 and 83, which includes damage and destruction to the temple in the city of Jerusalem, Psalm 74 and 70. Nine. So there's, there's, there's difficulty, community laments, the community is lamenting, and it has to do with the enemies um, taking over and causing havoc in the uh, temple and in Jerusalem. And of course, we're going to come here to the end of book three and, and uh, have more of that. But there are expressions of hope in book three. Uh, the second part of Psalm 73 would be a tremendous expression of hope for God's people. Um, 
and the, the community laments in book three are followed by psalms that offer a foundation for a future hope based on several factors. God's power to judge the wicked, his faithfulness to his people in the past. So the community laments of 79 and 80 are followed by psalms that call for renewal, that God's people would listen to him and walk in his ways, 81, and that focuses on the beauty of God's dwelling place with a call for God to show favor to the anointed king, Psalm 84. And then you have Psalm 86, the individual lament of David. It is an individual lament of David that asks God to show him steadfast love in the face of his enemies as he has done in the past. It's interesting that this is where the Psalm of David occurs and it uses that word steadfast love. That is going to be a key word in the Psalter actually, especially moving forward. Steadfast love, that's the translation in the ESV of the word for hesed, covenant faithfulness, covenant loyalty of God. And in Psalm 87 is a short Psalm of Zion celebrating the glories of the inhabitants of the city of God who come from other nations. But then the way book Psalm 3 ends is really significant. It ends with two individual lament psalms that seem to devastate the hope found in these earlier psalms. Psalm 88 is the darkest psalm in the Psalter. <clears throat> it has no movement toward confidence or praise. It literally ends in darkness. We'll come in the next lecture to talk a little bit more about Psalm 88. It literally ends in darkness. And even though the psalmist cries out three times to God, there's no response to, to the psalmist in Psalm 88. And then Psalm 89 seems to intensify what's going on in Psalm 88. Psalm 89 has been called a turning point in the book. Book three has already mourned the fall of the temple. 73, Psalm 73, Psalm 74, Psalm 79, Psalm 84. And now it mourns the fall of the king. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to, to look at the flow of Psalm 89. It, it begins, the first half of Psalm 89 is just a wonderful setting forth of the covenant promises that God has made to David and, and the impact and power of those covenant promises. And then um, there's a turning point in Psalm 89. The recounting of the Davidic promises in Psalm 89 only makes the tension unbearable when the king is cast down. 89.39, the crown is defiled. 89.40, and the covenant apparently renounced. 89.40. It, it's, it's, it's the difference between the first part of the psalm and the second part of the psalm is really striking. Um, psalm 89 also does not end with confidence or praise of God, but with a series of questions asking God how long his anger will burn and calling on God to show his steadfast love again. So, because Psalm 2 and Psalm 72 emphasize the success of the Davidic promises, and even Psalm 89 at the beginning emphasizes the success of the Davidic promises, the failure of these promises of the covenant at the end of Psalm 89 demands a response. So, that's book three. Um, it ends uh, with a terrible catastrophe that has happened, and I think is probably describing uh, the 486, 487 destruction of the temple and the um, destruction, not complete destruction, but the taking away of the king. The temple is destroyed, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed, and the kingship is in shambles because now the Babylonian army is in control of everything, as you know the story. I really think that's what's being described here in Psalm 89. Book four. There's also a change of author <clears throat> at the beginning of book four. Psalm of Moses. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a minute. There's another significant change moving from books one to three to books four and five. Very interesting. In books one through three, most psalms have a title that designated an author. Only about seven or eight psalms in books one through three do not have a title that designates an author. In books four and five, in other words, huge majority of psalms in books one through three have a title with an author. 
In books four and five, there are 61 psalms. Only 19 have titles that designate an author. So a lot less psalms in books four and five have a title. And of course, in book four, uh, there are at least two Davidic psalms, maybe three, 101 and 103 are designated as Davidic psalms. Some, some would want to maybe put 102 also as a Davidic psalm. So in book four, not very many Davidic psalms uh, again. So <clears throat> what's the narrative of book four? The context of book four is the exile. It answers the questions raised at the end of book three. Okay, Psalm 89, 49, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old? Which by your faithfulness you swore to David. Where are your covenant promises that you swore to David? I mean, everything's in shambles. Um, where are those covenant promises? That's the question at the end of Psalm 89. Uh, and I think, um, therefore, book four really is a reflection of the exilic period. And the first psalm is the psalm of Moses. If it looks like the promises of God to David are in jeopardy with the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of the king, you go back to the foundations of your life as a nation. Psalm 90 takes the reader back to the beginning of ancient Israel's history before the monarchy when Israel relied on Yahweh. The major message of Psalm 99, I'm sorry, Psalm 90, not 99, Psalm 90, is that God is eternal. The life of mankind is frail. And there's a request that God would show favor to his people. Some argue there are parallels with the golden calf incident so that Moses pleads for Israel in Psalm 90 as he did for Israel back in Exodus 32 through 34. Then you have Psalm 91, the strongest psalm of confidence in the Psalter. It's almost like the promises in Psalm 91 are too good to be true. When you read through Psalm 91, you'll see that. I try to answer that in, uh, in my discussion of Psalm 91 in the book, The Messiah and the Psalms. We don't have time to, to do that here. But the strongest psalm of confidence in the Psalter, which encourages people to take refuge in God. Psalm 92 gives thanks for God's steadfast love, uh, which is a partial answer to 8949. You know, where is your steadfast love? Psalm 92 gives thanks for God's steadfast love. And then Psalms 93 through 99 have the theme, the Lord reigns. Yahweh, he's your king. You may have lost your earthly king, but you still have God as your king. And he reigns over the nations. And then Psalm 100 reminds the people that they are still God's people and that his steadfast love endures forever. Then you have Psalm 101 and 104, celebrate the wondrous works of God. Psalm 101, a Psalm of David, celebrates the steadfast love. Again, celebrates the steadfast love. This word just keeps re recurring over and over again. The steadfast love and justice of God ending with a promise that the wicked will be destroyed. Okay, that's, that's the Psalm of David there in 101. 102, not designated as a Psalm of David. It's designated as the prayer of an afflicted man. <laughs> that would certainly fit David. Uh, with a great promise in verses 25 through 28 of God's faithfulness to establish his people. And in Psalm 103 is another Psalm of David, praising God for his covenant faithfulness with the use of steadfast love in verse 17. He's still a God who will fulfill his covenant promises. Psalm 104 doesn't have a title. It praises God for his works of creation. So you have a series of psalms here that is really emphasizing the greatness of the God and his works on behalf of his people and that he is a God who will keep his covenant promises. Psalm 105 to 106, close out book four. Both psalms review the history of Israel. If you ever look at these two psalms together, it's easy to see this. Psalm 105 speaks of the wondrous works of God. So 105 goes through the history of Israel and just recounts the wondrous works of God on behalf of his people. Psalm 106 goes over the same history with an emphasis on the sinfulness and rebellion of God's people. So it goes over the history with a different emphasis. And it ends 
Psalm 106 ends in verses 40 to 46, um, which speaks of their captivity in other nations, ending with a plea right before the doxology that ends book four. This is verse 47. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory and your praise. So it's a call for God to deliver his people from exile. Save us from the nations because we have been exiled to the nations. That's clearly stated. Gather us from the nations. That's why I think book four, uh, in light of what we see in Psalm 89, book four I think does reflect probably Israel's experience in exile. So to summarize, Book four, even though during the exile there was no king in Jerusalem, the Lord is Israel's king, and he reigns as the king of the world. God has not forgotten his covenant promises, which is seen in the many times steadfast love is used in book four in answer to the question of Psalm 89, 49. The Psalms of David, 101, 103, give hope to God's people by celebrating the covenant faithfulness of God. All right, that brings us to book five. 107 and 150. There's not a change of authorship at the beginning of verse five because Psalm 105 and 106 don't have an author connected to them. Neither does Psalm 107. So we don't have a change of authorship here. There are some distinctive things in book five we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, what is significant in book five is the return of Davidic Psalms. You know, David wrote them when he was alive, but now they are used in book five, as we're going to see, I think, to make a case for something. So, so Davidic Psalms have been virtually absent in books three and four. One Davidic Psalm in book three, 86. Two or maybe three Davidic Psalms in book four, 101, 102, 103. And now in book five, 14. Davidic Psalms with two collections, 108 to 110, 138 to 145, that frame Book 5. We'll talk about that. And then there are other Psalms of David scattered throughout Book 5, 122, 124, 133. Actually, those all occur in the Song of Ascents uh, section. And then 132, Psalm 132 is not a Psalm of David, but it mentions David and his concern for the building of a temple uh, and the covenant promises that God has made to David. There is an emphasis uh, in Book 5 on the Davidic covenant. Uh, there's a refrain that occurs in Psalm 107, 1, 118, 1, and 29, and 136, 1. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Um, so we have this emphasis uh, again in Book 5. Now, <clears throat> what is the narrative of book five, quote unquote, narrative, story, general story? Well, what's significant about book five, it's composed of various groups of psalms. And these groups of psalms emphasize matters that would be important to the post-exilic community, which has rebuilt the temple, right? Cyrus's decree that God's people can return to the land. They return to the land, very difficult at the beginning, the decree of Cyrus 539, 538, uh, but that temple is rebuilt with Haggai and Zechariah's encouragement in 516, rebuilt and rededicated. And then, of course, you know the work of Ezra uh, in the post-exilic situation trying to uh, build that community uh, based on the Mosaic Covenant and the law of God. So that seems to be the context. Uh, and we, I say that's the context because of what we see at the very beginning of Book 5. Book 5 begins with a psalm of thanksgiving, which answers the plea at the end of Psalm 146. 146, 7, save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from among the nations. Huh. Well, look at, look at what's, what's said at Psalm 107, the very first psalm in Book 5. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands. He's done it. At the end of book four, Psalm 106, Lord, save us. 
gather us from the lands. And the first psalm in book five says he's done it. He's gathered in from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Um, so so I th that's why I, I think uh, book five then um, would reflect uh, that post-exilic situation. And so in book five, of course, we have this massive psalm, right? 119 on the law of God. That's kind of the very heart of book five. The law is to be the foundation of the rebuilding of that community. It's not only for individual Israelites in Psalm 1, not only for, for the king in Psalm 1 and 2, the law is very important, but it is for uh, that post exilic community to be the foundation upon which they would build that community. So there's a, there's a reason why you have this massive Psalm 119 there. And then surrounding Psalm 119, you have groups of psalms that also emphasize things that are significant for that community. So there are two groups of psalms that emphasize worship that surrounds Psalm 119. You have the Egyptian Hillel Psalms, 113 to 118. Some expand that a little bit, but 113 to 118, they have the theme of deliverance from Egypt, and they were probably sung at the Passover. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing to read through 113 to 118 and imagine yourself sitting at that Last Supper because there's all kinds of emphasis in 113 to 118 about God's deliverance of his people. And they're, they're singing these psalms, and Jesus knows he's headed toward the cross. Lane, in his commentary, I, I wish I'd have brought along a quote, has a magnificent quote, his commentary on Mark, uh, related to how these psalms would have impacted Jesus from his human nature, right, um, as these psalms were sung there at that last Passover. <clears throat> so that's 113 to 118, the Egyptian Hillel Psalms. And then on the other side of, of Psalm 119 are the Song of Ascents, 120 to 134, that emphasize worship at the temple during the festivals. So you got 119, and then you've got two groups of, of uh, psalms that emphasize worship, and then you have two groups of Davidic psalms. And I want to come back in just a second to talk about those two groups of Davidic psalms. Before I do that, let me talk about the psalms briefly at the end of the Psalter. 146 to 150, close out the Psalter with hymns that begin and end with praise the Lord. You know, hallelujah uh, in the Hebrew. Um, and Psalm 150 is really the concluding doxology, I think, of the Psalter. As one uh, commentator says, the, the Psalter ends with the fireworks of praise from 146 to 150. And I really think uh, the purpose of this is that the Psalter ends in a climax of praise because this basically represents the destiny of God's people. Psalm 1 lays out the two ways, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, but God's people will. And but when you get to Psalm 150, we've reached our true destiny. Um, Chief end of, what's the chief end of man? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what you have here at the end of the Psalter. So this is, this is the destiny of God's people, uh, including, uh, including our destiny. So that's how the, the Psalter ends. But, but then before that, you, you have really at the beginning of book five and then toward the end of book five, just before these um, hallelujah psalms, you have two groups of Davidic psalms. So these two groups, 108 to 110, 138 to 145, they frame uh, book five. And based on content and placement, I would argue these psalms keep alive the hope of the Davidic covenant, that a king will once again reign on the throne. That's what the post-exilic community is looking for. Um, everything is in place except there's no king, right? Temple, uh, trying to establish the community based on the, 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 the law of Moses. Um, there's just no king. Everything is set up for the coming of the king, and they're looking for, they're desiring for a coming of the king. Um, book five begins with praise for the Lord's steadfast love, 107, 1. 
108 and 109 emphasize that as well. And then that kind of sets us up for Psalm 110, which you're all familiar with the content of Psalm 110. It's a royal psalm of the triumph of a priest king. Psalm 110 is rooted in the promises of the Davidic covenant, points toward a greater David that will come. Um, this psalm looks forward to a king who will be David's Lord, who will be a priest, who will reign at the right hand of God over his enemies. So this son is co-enthroned, uh, and clearly there is uh, ascension for sure. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So if Psalm 2 to give big picture, Psalm 2 presents the raging enemies of the Davidic king, and Psalm 89 presents the victory of the enemies over the king. Psalm 110 promises victory again, that this king who comes will have victory over his enemies. So Psalm 110, a very important psalm right there at the end of that first collection. Then Psalm 138 to 145 Psalms of David that celebrate uh, a victorious reign or a coming victorious reign of the king. Psalm 144 especially is important here, a royal psalm that comes near the end of this second group of Davidic psalms. Uh, it keeps alive the hopes of the post-exilic community for a Davidic king. It's related to Psalm 18, and Psalm 18 focuses on redemption accomplished. Psalm 144 is a call for God to deliver again. And because of its placement in the Psalter, the future hope, I think, expressed in Psalm 144 of God to deliver again, uh, it, that eschatological hope, I think, is also reflected in Psalm 149, which is a part of those closing uh, hallelujah psalms. But, but 149, it's amazing. It talks about how God takes pleasure in his people and that his people should sing for joy and let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to execute on them the judgment written. I mean, you have God's people here participating in this great last eschatological battle that's going to take place. Uh, when this king comes. Um, and so this final victory of God's people is, is, is what is being looked for uh, with the coming of a king who will reign. So that's the general narrative, if you will, of the Psalter based on the evidence that we see of the of the content and different types of the Psalms. All right, so I want to draw a couple conclusions. And, and, uh, and there's something else here that um, we will do in terms of this, the conclusions that uh, will relate to what's on your handout. So conclusions based on the analysis of the Psalter as a book. All right, the role of the Davidic Psalms are key in telling the story of kingship. They tell the early story of kingship in Israel, especially the establishment of David as king related to his sufferings and trials. They are key in Book 5, the Davidic Psalms are key in Book 5, to keep alive in the post-exilic situation the future hope of a king. Yes, a king from the line of David will come. God will be faithful to his covenant promises. But it's not just the Davidic royal psalms. It's the promises that God made in the Davidic covenant. This is conclusion number two. It's, it's the Davidic covenant that the promises of the Davidic covenant permeate the Psalter. Um, they're re really reflected uh, in the royal psalms, and, and we saw their emphasis there in, in, in book four and five with the use of the word steadfast love. Also, it's very interesting, Key royal psalms are placed at strategic positions in the Psalter, not only to emphasize the role of the Davidic king, but to tell the story of kingship. Psalm 2. Let me, let me, let me lay this out. I think, I think this is maybe in your handout. Psalm 2 is the coronation of the king. You are my son. Today I've begotten you. It's the very beginning of the Psalter. 
Psalm 72 in the book two, a description of the righteous reign of a righteous king. Psalm 89, the humiliation of the king. As we talked about the difficulties that came upon the king there, and we'll come back to that in, 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 in just a bit, either in this lecture or the next one. Psalm 110, the triumph, even the ascension of the victorious priest king. Last psalm in the first group of Davidic psalms and in Psalm 144, toward the end of that second group of Davidic psalms, the final looking forward to the final victory of the king. Interesting, the last Davidic psalm in that group, 145, praises God for deliverance and ends in a doxology that then kind of sets you up for the closing uh, psalms of the book that do emphasize praise. These psalms map out the life of the Messiah. Coronation, righteous reign, humiliation, resurrection, ascension, and final triumph. This is the path Jesus took. Psalm 2, 2 7 is alluded to at Jesus' baptism. His earthly coronation, and it also is used to refer to his resurrection, which maybe is the beginning of his heavenly coronation, if you want to use that word, his, his exaltation. Psalm 72 reflects the righteous reign of Christ in his works. That's all over the, the place in the Gospels. The Gospel of Christ is good news to the poor because he delivers from oppression, Matthew eleven five, You've got uh, Jesus himself in Luke 4, you know, referring back to Isaiah 61. Um, and it's interesting that before the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, Jesus is on a mountain, John 6, 3. It's, it's interesting that in Psalm 72, Psalm 72 is that psalm that reflects the righteous reign of a righteous king. In Psalm 72, 3 and 16, the mountains bear prosperity for the sake of God's people. After the multitudes are fed, the feeding of the 5,000, the people come to try to make Jesus king. Do they see the connections between prosperity and kingship. Obviously, it wasn't the time uh, for Jesus. And they were probably looking for a king that um, was a victorious king, which Jesus will be in his second coming. And he was victorious in his first coming, but in a bit different way, as, as you understand. But, but Psalm 72, the righteous reign of a righteous king, you can make connections uh, to, to Jesus, his earthly ministry, um, and the things that took place there. Psalm 89, Sets forth the defeat and humiliation of Christ. 38 through 44 of Psalm 89. Um, the anointed one has been cast off and rejected. The full wrath of God was against the anointed one, Psalm 89 says, which we know Christ took that upon himself, not for his own disobedience, but for the disobedience of his people. The right hand of his enemies seemed to triumph over him. Now he was crucified on the cross. Criminals are crucified on the cross. Um, and so you have the humiliation of the king in Psalm 89 described in ways that would reflect what happened with Christ. In Psalm 110, this priest, this king priest is raised in triumph and sits at the right hand of God until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet, Acts 2, 34 and 35. And then Psalm 144 looks forward to the ultimate triumph of Christ, which will occur at the second coming. Now, our king reigns now. Jesus reigns now at God's right hand, and we await his final coming and victory when that reign of Christ will become known to everyone, that worldwide reign of Christ. And we will be vindicated as his people, and we will receive the fullness of covenant blessings. So the placement of those psalms seems to be significant. So what are the implications of seeing the Psalter as a book that tells a general story of kingship as related to the history of Israel. I think this statement that I'm about to make is there in your handout. It says, the Psalter tells a general story of the history of kingship as it relates to the history of Israel with an emphasis on the Davidic covenant, which means that there is a typology of kingship throughout the Psalter from which the apostles would draw from to refer to Christ. Maybe this explains the freedom of the apostles to refer to a lot of the Psalms, even those that aren't what considered to be directly 
messianic. In other words, if I can unpack this a little bit, uh, we have laid out in the Psalter a narrative rooted in a Davidic typology, Davidic meaning a king from the line of David, from which the apostles can draw freely. This Davidic typology occurs in a broad narrative of kingship developed in the history of Israel so that any psalm can be used to reflect the trials and triumph of Christ. This may explain the freedom of the apostles. Again, to refer to Psalm 6, allude to other psalms uh, that relate to Christ, even though none of those psalms have ever made the messianic psalm list. And if that's the case, then I think it gives us freedom to use any psalm in the Psalter. Appropriately, right? This can be abused, but, but to appropriately and legitimately think of how a psalm might relate to Christ. So, we are not limited, we, uh, those who are Christians and interpreting the psalms, we are not limited to the connections the apostles make from the psalms to Christ, but we can think of how all the psalms might refer to Christ. So, so I think looking at the Psalter as a book, telling a general story, uh, as we've laid out here, with a Davidic typology um, related to the Davidic covenant, may explain um, how the apostles are using the Psalms. Thus ends the lecture.